Artists sometimes find inspiration and solace in a muse. But for Helen Humphreys, there is a better four-legged solution to the isolating long hours that define a writer's workday. Her new book explains. It's called and a dog called Fig, Solitude, Connection, The Writing Life. And we're pleased to bring Helen Humphreys to her virtual studio from Calgary, Alberta. Hi, so nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. I really, me yeah, I really, really love this book. Um, what inspired you to write this book about Fig? Well, I, I got, I've had Fischlis for a lot of my life and I got Fig as a puppy just before the pandemic actually in December. And, and I had seemed to have forgotten, even though I'd had puppies previously, how demanding having a, a puppy picture? was. Yeah, <laughs> that's Fig, <laughs> yeah, Fig at seven weeks. And I realized when I got the puppy, I wouldn't be able to write because they're just, they're so demanding and they're just biting and, you know, the, the kind of the chaotic nature of the puppy was not conducive to, to writing. So I decided I would just keep a kind of puppy diary while I had the puppy and just, just and that's sort of how the book started. It just kind of evolved from and this little diary I kept when she was a baby. And Fig is adorable. We're going to talk about Vishla's in a, a second, but um, you've written poetry, novels, and literary, uh, literary nonfiction like this book. How did you become a writer? Uh, I've always written. I was one of those writers that, since I was a child, I, I wrote. As soon as I could read, I started writing, and I sort of you know, wrote serious novels when I was 10 and that sort of thing. So I've just it's just always been the way I've expressed myself, I guess. And, and you were um, and you were shy too as a child, right? Yeah, I was really shy. I was actually, we moved from England when I was really a young child. And I think that made me kind of chronically shy. And so people would talk to me uh, in Canada and I would just like lie on the ground and scream, I think. <laughs> and not, I wasn't able to, to talk to people. So I, I kind of, we emigrated with a dog uh, called Lisa. My parents bred St. Bernard's in England and she was the mother dog and we emigrated with her. And so I still had a, a close relationship with her. And I think I just, you know, took out, I, she became my companion and instead of, you know, humans. Well, the way you described Lisa's drool was very uh, realistic. <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, she was 150 pounds. She's large. And she had, you know, St. Bernard's have these long ropes of drool down the sides of their faces. And so when, always there, and she would shake her head and they would just sort of attach to whatever was around the dog, which so it could be you or it could be the wall. Or, it's always, um, it's always it was, good to get out of her way. I just remember, I could just picture you as a little girl just being covered with this dog's uh, so you spit. But um, Helen, you're going to read something from us uh, from the book. Uh, and um, if you could uh, take it away for us, please. Well, yes. Being a writer is confusing because it is both lonely and all consuming. It is no surprise to me that writers often suffer from mental health issues or substance abuse issues or even kill themselves. It is hard to stay healthy in a profession that has so much instability and failure built into it. It is hard to remain in the state of vulnerability necessary for creation while also handling the demands of life and making a living and dealing with all the rejection that is standard fare. There is always rejection in a writer's life, whether for a grant or a prize or being turned down by a publisher. It never ends. Sometimes the loneliness is the easier part. I mean, that last line, sometimes the loneliness is the easier part. Um, do you think writers are inherently solitary people? I think most of them are. Most of the ones I know are because it it's, uh, it's, seems to be necessary for creation to be in that alone space. I don't know many, I know some writers who can write in a crowd or, or crowded place or with other people around, but I know more that, that need the solitude and the aloneness. And then of course it just sort of morphs into loneliness, I think. It's, Are you a solitary writer? I am a solitary writer, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can't, um, I can't have noise around me, I think. When I'm writing, it just gets in my head and gets in the way. Does having a dog kind of force you to come out of your shell a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the dog is great because dogs don't talk. I mean, they are expressive, but unlike a human, they aren't going to ask you a question or want something from you. They'll sort of exist in your space with you, so you're not completely alone, but they are quiet themselves and, and in, into their own you know, worlds already. So it's like how you can have a companion, 
without having to have an intrusion, I, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, I thought it was really uh, beautiful the way that you were writing about how you see things, especially when you are with a dog. Um, in your book, you write about being aware of inhabiting spaces, spaces once filled with previous dogs, maybe, or loved ones who passed. How does sharing those spaces make you feel? Yeah, it's I, I, it's um it's funny. I got the new puppy fig, and I took her when she was probably too young, and it was the middle of winter, so it was freezing. But we went for a walk where I had taken, you know, I used to take my old dog Charlotte, who was a fantastic dog, and who had only died the previous summer. And there was this moment in the walk where we crossed this field that I had crossed with Charlotte many, many times, and I could feel those two moments kind of intersect with one another. I mean, they were separated by time, but there was an overlapping that was you know, kind of beautiful. And I thought, oh, there's a kind of continuity to having a dog that sort of just goes past the life of the dog itself and and just joins everything up together. And that's, uh, I don't know, beautiful and, and kind of wonderful experience in my life, I guess. You also wrote that when you were with your dogs, you would always see these incredible creatures like stags. Uh, I will tell you a funny story. Last week, my dog Zoe got sprayed by a skunk. And <laughs> it was at one moment, uh, so my husband was walking, Zoe, Zoe got st uh, sprayed by the skunk and then ran. And then my husband saw Zoe and the skunk and then he ran. So this picture of my big husband and the dog <laughs> all running from this little skunk. But you write about all these magical moments when you were with your dog and you saw these wonderful creatures. When it happened, what was that like for you? Because it happened many, many times. Yeah, people, you know, lots of people say that having a dog gets in the way of seeing nature, but I have found the opposite because what happens is usually the dog is aware of other creatures that are there before I am. So the dog will stop and sniff the air or they'll see something and then I'll see it as well. So I find that, you know, the dog really helps me see all the other animals and birds that are out there. And, and is a um, there's always, every time on a, a dog walk will will see something that I would probably have not have seen if I was just by myself. And so I'm really grateful for that. I wanted to talk more about spaces. Um, one such space that you filled was at a writer's colony and it was a room that used to be Sylvia Plath. Um, how has Sil Sylvia Plath influenced you and your writing? Well, I was I was um, a young poet and I, when I first read Sylvia Plath and she had, she's, um, the, I guess the generation, two generations ahead of me, she's my mother's generation and her children are, are my generation. So there's a sort of a, there, she's close enough to sort of, um, you know, be in the room with in a sense. And then I literally was in her room in, in uh, at Yaddo when I went to the arts colony down there. Um, yeah, I was very influenced by her poetry when I was young and it had a big effect on me. And so it was, um, it was another one of those intersection moments, you know, when I went to Yaddo and I got to use her studio to write in. And it was very, I think, quite unchanged from how she had used it. She had described it in one of her diaries, the furniture being in the same position it was when I used it. So there was this odd sense again that I had sort of slipped into her world without actually being in her world. Um, you know what, I love those experiences actually. I kind of love that, those moments where you kind of slide through time or in or out of time. Her bed was where it was when she was there too. Um, so the central question in your book, uh, and a dog called Fig, is what have your dogs brought to your writing life? Has this book helped you answer that question? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I really got to think about it I, in a way that I hadn't thought about it before. And I had noticed things before, had you know little sort of revelations here and there, but I never really considered it in a, a kind of more longer way that and i was able to do that with this book so it's um yeah the dogs have been i think i've had a much healthier writing life because i've had the dogs honestly i think that because of the loneliness that's kind of built into writing um you know my life could have gone a different way but the, having the companion of the dogs and having the dogs pull me out of writing to go for a walk or be in their world be in the immediate world has really i think kept me healthy well, in the book, I was going to say that you describe um, what your work day is like. Um, you describe what you do in the morning, in the afternoon. I thought it was really interesting that you chose to go on these walks where you wouldn't run into too many people. Uh, so the question, I guess, is how, how has sharing your life with a dog given you the structure that you need uh, to write? 
Yeah, well, it's, um, first of all, it's active, which really helps the brain. You know, walking is one of those things that really goes well with writing. I think there's been lots of people have written about that, how well those two things go together. So starting the day off, I started off with a big, big walk with the dog before I, I work. And I think that really kind of gets my brain moving and my thoughts moving. And then, you know, every few hours I have to come out of writing to go and walk the dog. But I think sometimes even though I resent those interruptions, um, they end up being really good because I come back refreshed in a way that I wouldn't have been if I had just remained at my desk. So it's always a, a, a pause that refreshes rather than a pause that disrupts, I think. How would how was that impacted during the pandemic? Because you before you would go and there would be no one there, but walking was one thing that all of us could access. Uh, how was that impacted for you in that time that you had for yourself? Yeah, that was hard, the pandemic, because literally everybody was in all the places where I had previously enjoyed them, you know, completely by myself sometimes. And... Uh, yeah, so I just had to stagger my hours. I had to sort of go further afield and also go different earlier or later so I wouldn't run into people. I, th I think I just sort of, you know, worked around the crowds and and uh, did it that way. But I'm lucky where I live in Kingston because there's a lot of there's a lot of wilderness areas just right around the city that I'm able to access and I can choose different ones. So. I find it interesting because I think when we say the word lonely, um, even just for the passage that you read to us, all these things can happen to writers because they are they are by themselves. But I, I get the sense that you like being lonely. It's not a bad thing. It's okay. Yeah, I'm used to it. Like you know, it's not a, it's not a terrible loneliness. I don't think it's a loneliness that's at this point that's um, damaging. I think it's just a loneliness that's kind of a. a prerequisite to being a writer or condition of being a writer. I think that's a better way of putting it. So I'm okay with it. I've done it long enough. I know what it is and I know how to handle it, I guess. And it's it's all right. It's it's not progressive, I think. That's that's the thing. It's not a progressive loneliness. It's just a, a situational loneliness. Well, um, you, I'm going to prepare the audience for some uh, cuteness because we're going to talk about the visualists that you have owned and you've owned three dogs as an adult um, and you've stuck to one breed. Why visualists? Why is that your breed? Well, you know, they're, they're not an easy dog, I think, in terms of dogs because they're high energy, they're a hunting dog, and they're also... Um, high energy and kind of high needs. They need to be around you. They don't, they're, they're not uh, dogs you can leave alone for long periods of time, but I like their level of engagement with humans and with the world. And I think I've become kind of really attached to that level of engagement. And that's why I like them. They're funny, they're curious, they're playful, they're, they're smart. Vishla is when they're younger, uh, they have blue eyes, right? Can they you describe what they look like? Yeah. Yeah, they start with blue eyes and then their eyes go green actually. And then and then it takes a long time before their eyes go kind of amber. Usually that happens around a year or a year and a half or something, but Figgy's eyes are still a bit green. So in some ways I think she's still a puppy even though she's almost two and a half now. They're just stunning uh, creatures. Uh, let's talk about your first Vishla, Hazel. Can you tell us about her? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, before before today, I was thinking about how it matters when you get a dog. Mm. doesn't it you know like that that that's part of the experience of having the dog and I think because I was in my 30s when I got Hazel I was pretty young compared to how I am now and uh, I, I was very active then and so a lot of my experiences with Hazel were experiences canoeing or you know hiking or they were out in the natural world because I spent a lot of my time out there so she was a great dog she lived to be uh, she looks she's pretty old in that picture we just saw she has her white face Mm. And she lived to be 13 and a bit. And she died the same week your brother did? Yes, yes, the same. My brother died on the 3rd of December and she died on the 8th of December. It was a terrible week. Unexpectedly, she died unexpectedly. Yeah. How did that impact you to lose uh, two, love of, two loves of your life? Yeah, I was pretty numb to it, actually. I had just flown back. My brother had died in, and he died in uh, BC and I had just flown back and... Uh, Hazel sort of, you know, I took her out in the morning and she peed blood and I took her to the vets and the vet said she was full of cancer and had to be euthanized. So she was euthanized the next day. So it was all kind of this numbing, you know, horror, I guess, that 
that was hard to bear at the time. But you had another uh, puppy called um, Charlotte. Why was Charlotte so? Why was Charlotte so special? Well, Charlotte, I think, was a visual anomaly actually because she was really calm, confident, and really kind of wise and from a very young age I, I could do things with her at six months that I still can't do with Fig at two and a half <laughs> because she was just so sensible and <laughs> and laid back you know um but Charlotte was great because I had I had I, I got her shortly after my brother died I got her in the spring he had died in December and I had a series of losses that went along with his death Hazel's death I had a relationship breakup I had two friend one friend die another friend get, got um, diagnosed with terminal cancer. There are all these things that happen. So the dog, you know, I was lucky in Charlotte. She was this kind of calm presence and it really helped me get through that that time. I think more than anything, I, I, I depended on her nature. She had that really great nature. She, her eyes were just kind of, it's like you felt you could see inside her, like into her soul. Yeah. I know, she was a very soulful dog and she was yeah. very kind of magical dog, I think. And, and the weird thing about Charlotte uh, that is, is 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 strange to me sometimes is after she died, you know, we did this same walk every day. We saw the same people. We had this kind of patch of ground we went over, you know, for nine years. And right after she died, all those people that I used to see every day there, we would see, dis like, they just disappeared and they never came there again. So it's almost like her whole world disappeared at the same time as she did, which was a strange thing. Kind of magical, I guess. Well, you're, um, I was really touched with your understanding of grief and love. Uh, people said to you that Charlotte was irreplaceable. Your own grandmother lost her husband, your grandfather, at a very young age uh, during World War II, and she thought she could never love again. You disagreed. How so? Yeah, I think you have to love again. I think, I think love the act of loving is about being engaged with life, and I think to be alive, to be fully alive, we have to be engaged with life, even if it leads to grief. I mean, it's just it's just part of it, you know? So so if you've loved once, yeah, go out and love again, like love harder, I think. Lo love as much as possible, love as many people, and animals as you can. We're only here for such a short time. I've heard it described this way, that love is the price we pay for being alive. Yeah, that's good, that's right. I wanted to read something else that you write in the book. Um, you write in the book, being with any young animal, and I include babies in this, is an excellent way to study character. How does anyone become who they are? What are the subtle shifts of personality growth? One of the reasons I like having a dog from puppyhood is because I will be there for all of their development and will know the dog deeply. There will be no surprises. I will not have to piece together my dog's backstory based on individual bits of evidence that present themselves over time. Um, this is something else that really touched me because at one point when Fig and you are getting to know each other, you wonder about um, what it was like for Fig to leave her family and to leave uh, her siblings. And I've never thought of, um, it, I've never thought of people actually thinking about that. It's kind of like, you take the puppy and it's my puppy, but the way you describe it, it's like we're strangers and we're living together and we're trying to figure out, you know, like how we got along. So I thought that was really beautiful the way you described that. Thank you. I, yeah, it's. I mean, you're forced into aren't, you're forced into an intimate relationship with a puppy, but you're essentially strangers, and it's just, it's a, a odd because you know with a human baby at least they're the same species as you and probably or might not be related to you, but they're the same species, so you have an understanding, but with a puppy, they're completely different, and and then yet you have to in, you have to exist very intimately right from the beginning. So I think there's a lot from both sides. You know, they don't necessarily like you in the beginning. I think all my dogs have not necessarily liked me right from the start. They just wanted to, you know, go back to their real family. Hmm. Well, I, I wanted to share some of my puppy's uh, pictures because uh, during the pandemic we adopted a rescue called Zoe, and she's a mix of German Shepherd and Lab. There she is as a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was interested in what you said about being there for the development, and that's my daughter with Zoe, BFFs. Um, what do you think we've missed from not being there from the very beginning? Uh, how, but your puppy looked quite young. How old was your puppy when you got her? We got her at eight weeks. Oh, yeah. Well, you were there from the beginning, because usually they take the, you know, you don't get them much before that. 
that's that's the time that, that it's good to separate them from their mother. It's the time they can be separated. So, I mean, you probably, you know, you just, I don't know, you, what you missed, I guess, was the close relationship with the siblings and and the mother that they have. But your book helped me understand that because there is signs. There seems to be a little bit of trauma that she exhibits if we mm-hmm. leave, or there's certain things that scare her that we don't understand. So even during that time, I think after reading your book, I understand her um, a little bit better. But I want to talk more about Fig because you would think the third Vishla would be easy for you, but Fig wasn't. What did you go through at the beginning with Fig? Yeah, she's the most difficult one I've had. I, I, I Because she's very, like, this is what I've learned about her. Like, you know, you have to study the puppy to figure out who they are aside from their breed. I mean, all breeds have characteristics, but all dogs are individuals. And so, you know, Figgy is a highly emotional dog and she's highly sensitive and, and <laughs> God, she's so cute there. <laughs> she's <laughs> adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's very, she's really, really sensitive. So she gets overstimulated really easily. So one of the things I, I know to do now is to try to keep the level of stimulus down for her so she can handle things easier. Well, that you, means a strict routine and, and keeping her out of the way of things that, you know, send her over the top, I guess. Well, you describe in the book uh, having like blood because <laughs> she was she was scratching you, she was biting you. you. At one point, your mom was visiting, and I think she also left her mark on uh, Fig. How did you and Fig end up working out your problem your problems? I don't know. I just we're just like Stockholm syndrome, right? Like we're just thrown together, so we have to we have to work them out. <laughs> like I don't know. It was rough though. She was very. She just just kind of operated out of her feelings without any governance on them, you know? And so I I don't know. I just, I think the best thing I did with her was just to really institute a routine really early on and stick to it and that she could then rely on that and not have to be in this hypervigilant state Mm -hmm. because she's not a highly confident dog. I think this is what I learned. You know, she feels she needs to be um, vigilant a lot of the time. And Charlotte was a very confident dog and didn't have that need. So I just sort of had to work with that, I guess. But we just, I guess we just got through it and she got older and I got smarter and and it's okay now. <laughs> so... <laughs> You've, got, you've learned how to get along. Uh, well, one of the most enjoyable parts of the book was learning about the eccentric dogs of many famous authors, or maybe it was the authors themselves who were eccentric. Um, is it true that Virginia Woolf relied on her dogs to pass judgment on her guests? Yes, especially her one dog called Grizzle, who was this kind of mongrel. Um, Grizzle would decide if they if she liked the guest or not. And if she didn't like the guest, she would rush to the door and which was her way of saying, it's time for you to leave now. <laughs> and Virginia Woolf said she was never wrong in this, in this judgment about deciding who should stay and who should go. <laughs> and I don't know if it was one of your dogs that you described or it was somebody, another author um, of, they would remember who bought them what? Like if they brought them like a gift, they would come That's to Charlotte. the door. That was Charlotte? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she could remember. If you bought her a toy ever, or a gift of any sort, she would remember what gift it was. And if you came back to visit, she'd bring that gift to show you that she still had it, I guess, or that she liked it. So that was uh, that was the thing she did. And then there was that one point when I think um, someone close to you suffered a loss and Charlotte put their head or their paw on the person's uh, yeah. heart. That's my partner. Yeah, she Charlotte put her paw right on the heart. Like, she was so... I don't know. That dog was, she was just, I don't know. It's just there's something special about her. Intuitive, right? I, it, that part yeah. of the book, I was like, <laughs> we don't deserve dogs. <laughs> um, James Thurber also had a biter, Muggs, uh, I guess, who would have put Fig to shame. How bad was his dog? Well, we don't say bad dogs, though. No, we can't say bad dogs. No. I say difficult dogs, D- I guess. Or yeah. challenging dogs. Challenging, maybe. yeah. Yeah, yeah. this was his childhood dog, and Muggs bit all these people, like Muggs bit everybody, in, including people in the family, so that James Thurber's mother had to feed Muggs on on the table. She, Muggs had to sit at the table because if you put the dish on the floor, the food, the dog would bite you. So Muggs had all these, Muggs sat at the table like a human and James Thurber's mother sent every year at Christmas, a box of candy to all the people that Muggs had bitten that year. And I think at one point she was sending upwards to 50 boxes of candy out. <laughs> But, you know, mugs continued to live and, <laughs> and uh, not, you know, even though 
he was just so, so bad and everybody's afraid of him. I think in this day and age, that might not be the, uh, the situation. Might not be the case, yeah. yeah. Oh, finally, which was your uh, favorite of the famous canines of the writers that you featured? I love the fact that you included Zora Neale Hurston because she's my favorite writer, one of my favorite writers. Yeah. I liked her dog. She talked yeah. about her dogs having jobs, which was really interesting, yeah. based on their personalities. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it have to, would have to be Thomas Hardy's dog because I think he was the most difficult dog and it, it was it is hard not to admire how difficult he was and how um, hard he would have been to live with because he would walk on the table during dinner when there was a dinner party and he would just take food from the plate of any of the guests that he felt like eating and, and nobody could stop him because he would bite you. And then he was addicted to the radio program called the Children's Hour, which was a British radio program. And Thomas Hardy bought him his own radio. And if Wessex, that was the dog's name, was out, they were out somewhere and the show was on, he would make a fuss and they would have to drive back so he could sit there and listen to his radio program. So I loved how, you know, Thomas Hardy just was bent, you know, did everything for this dog. Even at the end, he would love the dog so much, he carved his own tombstone when he died but that it was so he was such a difficult dog but you know that's the thing with dogs you put up with them where you wouldn't put up with that those qualities in a human necessarily you do put up with them and why do you do that i think because they give us so much right yeah and because you're responsible for them i mean what you know i, I think yeah they give you so much and i don't know there's some i think we're more willing to accept their their foibles than we are foibles from our partners or our loved ones. I think we're harsher on our human companions, maybe. And we're more easier on our, our, our animal companions. Well, because they don't want anything from us. They're pretty easy, maybe just food or walks. But Helen, what a terrific book. It's one of my favorite books, and I'm going to recommend it to as many people as I can. Thank you so much for being on the program. We really appreciate it, and congratulations. Thank you so much, Nan. The Agenda in the Summer with Nan Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.